all the unique characters. I do let them bang. Yeah, I say, like, yeah, I'm a legend, man. I'm building my legs. All the stories and perspectives featured weekly. I wasn't fully committed to that choke, and I kind of sunk into it, started squeezing tighter, and I kind of heard him gurgle a little bit. I was like, oh. And all the combat sports you could ask for in the best state in the U.S. Like I said, Ohio versus the world. It's gonna happen, for sure. Watch out. It'll be cool, man. I'm not worried about it. I'm gonna show them why the Ohio MMA scene is, in my opinion, one of the best MMA scenes in the country. This is Forged in OH. IO. OH. IO. OH. IO. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 89 of Forged in Ohio. My name is Jake Murrin and I'm the host of the podcast. If you're an MMA fan residing in the state of Ohio, then you've likely heard of Ronin Training Center. If you're a fan of Forged in Ohio, then you've definitely heard of Ronin Training Center. I've lost count of how many great athletes have joined me on the show from Ronin, and right when I think I've gotten around to them all, Another prospect or two arrives on the scene. Joining me today is one of those prospects. He is a 2-0 amateur mixed martial artist representing Ronin. It is Alexander Hazelwood. Thanks for coming on the show, Alexander, and welcome to Forged in Ohio. Uh, thanks, Jake, for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I've been waiting for this for a long time, so it's good to finally be on. Of course, man. I've been uh, having an eye on you for a while now. Now you have two wins, and it was a great time to welcome you on to Forged in Ohio. I want to start with your story before we get into the two amateur fights you've had. How did mixed martial arts enter your life? Uh, since I since I was a kid, man, it was you know my dad. He was young raising us, so you know he was always into the kind of MMA scene, going to the fights when we were kids, um, stuff like that, and. He always taught us to defend ourselves, you know. Uh, growing up where we grew up, he thought, you know, we'd run into problems, which we did, and we was able to, you know, defend ourselves. And I feel like it was a big part of his strategy, you know, and parenting us and just like implementing that. Me and my brother, he's, you know, we just we grew up doing that every day, and it kind of just stuck with me, I guess, the most. So. Yeah, it sounds like you were receptive to that growing up. Were, was that the case? Were you all about it when going to these events with your dad and, you know, learning how to protect yourself? Were you all about it or were you maybe hesitant at first? I was scared. I was uh, I was the shy kid. I was uh, I liked animals and I didn't like we played football and I didn't want to play football because I don't want to hurt kids. And uh, I don't know. One day it just it just switched. You know, it might have been puberty for me. I don't Around then, though, 13 years old, I just I kind of switched and I started kind of picking up an eye for training, kind of just looking in, kind of watching the Ohio MMA scene. And then I saw Asher Frederick fight and I was like, that's where I want to train. I want to look like that. Like, that's how I want to perform. So around 2020, that's when I got into it, like started training with the professionals. So. Yeah, so I mentioned Ronin Training Center in the intro, and I've had nearly every up-and-coming fighter from that gym on the show. It sounds like you found Ronin Training Center through Asher Shock and Rock Frederick. I, I feel like a lot of people have, and uh, he, uh, you know, he walks around, you know, a little cocky, and sometimes it gets to me. But he's like my big brother, man. He uh, he puts a lot on me, and uh, he's the reason I feel like I he puts those real fight simulations in the gym. So. I love training with that dude. So how long have you been at Ronin and how far has, you know, your game, your skills, how, how have they developed since you first started at the gym? Um, I started in around uh, 2020, um, around like, like that COVID time. So I started and I kind of had like a base skill already. And my first day in, um, I was 15, 16 years old and I saw Ryan Benedetto. He was working the front desk. And uh, this is kind of, this is kind of a, heart touching story for me because he saw me the first day I walked in and he was like man like before he even saw me hit a bag before he saw me move he was like you look I think you could be good like I think you could take this somewhere and we kind of started working on the side from there you know and then a year or two ago I, we started taking each other super seriously started putting in uh, a lot more work and uh, all the skills that I have all, all the striking all the all the sweet techniques all the calm you know that that's from him and my pops really so I give them all the love and respect in the world more than anybody. Was there anything from that first impression that made him think that you could be really good at this? Or was it just a gut feeling that he had that was like, yeah, that Alexander Hazelwood kid, he's going to be really good at this. 
Real recognize real, man. That's that's what we say to each other all the time. Uh, it was meant to be. Like, we grew up, uh, we had a lot of mutual, like, family, friends and stuff. You know, we was at cookouts together, but we never really talked. We kind of grew up in the same environment. So I feel like we click on a certain level that most, you know, guys and their coaches don't really have. So I, I appreciate that I found that so early on. Yeah, I love that relationship that you have with the people around you. Was there a moment that maybe you experienced at Ronin where you knew that it was the gym for you and you didn't really have to really branch out anywhere else? Uh, just the success everyone was putting out. Uh, you know, I started there, Travis was fighting, um, Skylar Bray was fighting, getting titles, and I was just, and those were the, you know, I was working with Skylar and Asher, and I was just like, this is where I want to be. I want to be where they're at, so I got to be in the room with them kind of thing. So. How much do the, the veterans in that building push you and make you want to be, you know, as great as you want to be? So, sometimes I feel like they, they put more effort in me than themselves. Like they, they push us. They want us to go f further than them and they have no ego at all about it. And that's something I really respect because sometimes I still get that. Like a kid will come in and he'll, he'll do really well against me and he shouldn't have. And I'll be like, ah. But they, you know, they'll, they'll tell me to go with it. They'll tell me what worked, what didn't work. And I really appreciate all those veterans. Was it hard at first to be pushed that hard in, in training and in practice? Or were you always open to it, even the early days where, you know, most people struggle in the gym? Yeah, I felt like I had something to prove. You know, I felt like I felt like I my dad has been, you know, teaching me these things. And I felt like I had a head start kind of. So I always went in there with like a chip on my shoulder. And I never tried to, you know, say no to rounds or say no to extra work. And, you know, it was kind of an ego thing at first. And maybe I pushed myself too far, you know, and Travis Davis told me I was training, you know, a lot as a, you know, young kid. And he was just like, you know, train every day like this, you're going to get hurt. He was like, you know, take your recovery seriously, take stuff like that seriously. So finding a balance really helped me out. So. So I still consider myself young at 23, and it's wild to me when I'm joined by guests who are actually younger than me. You're 20 years old, but at what age did you know, did you realize that you wanted to fight? Uh, I, uh, 13, 14 years old, you know, I, that's when I started hitting that the garage heavy, you know, not looking the best, you know, simple things, but uh, yeah, that's, it was just around that age and I just went all in. My dad told me kind of burn the boats. Like, if you really want to do this, you can't have backup plans. You can't, you got to believe in yourself more than anyone. And I, I stuck to that really hard. So kind of just burnt the boats. And, you know, this, this is what I have. You know, I have me and someone have it. It's, you know, me and someone sign a contract. You know, it's me against them uh, to take my dream. And, you know, if I don't win this fight, you know, I'm going to be a bum. That's how I look at it. I don't, I'm not going to get that belt gonna get those paychecks so i'm gonna take every fight as seriously as i can even at the amateur level because this is this is my future did it help especially early on having your dad's support i know in certain cases their parents might not want their kids to fight but it sounds like it was quite the opposite for you oh yeah yeah uh this is me and my dad's bond like this is all we talk about it's all we do like i have uh pictures of us christmas uh 2011 fighting and you know I was six years old so I've been doing it for a long time you know and just started training with the professionals so growing up in in the fight scene in combat sports being a fan was there maybe a fighter that you looked up to I know you had figures around you supporting you and that you were looked up looked up to but any fighters and styles that you really admired growing up uh you know my dad was a big uh Leota Machida fan um He's a big Fedor fan, so those guys, like the old guys. But I wasn't into the big scene at a young age. I was more into, like, the amateur guys. Like, I was watching, like, Asher, Skyler, Melvin, uh, Taylor, you know, guys like that. Nick Fox, I was watching guys like that fight. And that, those are guys who I was really getting into because those are guys that I could be in a room with kind of thing. You mentioned at, you know, 13, 14 years old, you realized that you wanted to fight. I'm just curious if there was a turning point where the idea of fighting actually became a passion and almost like it was something that you needed to do rather than wanting to do. Yeah, yeah, that was what that was, that's a good question. Um, and, you know, it's like everyone, there was that one little school fight that I had, you know, people were watching, there was a crowd, an audience, and 
I, j- I just like looking around and seeing everyone like watch me. I, I like, I like, I just liked how it felt. There was no, you can't describe it, you know? And that's why when I walk to the cage, I'm smiling the whole time. It's like, it's so nostalgic. It's like, a, I feel like a kid again, you know? So. Do you do a good job of being in the moment on that walk or does it kind of get to you sometimes of the pressure of the fight game and so many people showing up there to watch you compete? Uh, I take I take it in, dude. I uh, I plan it out so like meticulous and to the walkout. What what second I'm gonna walk out to? I I try to make it all perfect and just look at look at everyone. See my mom. See my dad. See see everyone that came to watch me. And I just feel honored to be there. You know, both times. So and I'm looking forward to more. Talking with Alexander Hazelwood on Forged in Ohio. Let's talk about your fights now. You debuted in May at Ohio Combat League 29 in a fight that lasted only 16 seconds. Is that how you envisioned your MMA debut going? Um, No, we we trained really hard. We wanted a first-round finish. Um, Just to put something on notice, just to let people know, like, I'm not new to this. I've been working. And, uh, you know, Parker, he had... Uh, kickboxing experience, you know, and uh, I thought it would be a really good fight. I like to strike. Uh, I started with jujitsu, but I like to strike. So I wanted it to be a striking match. And, you know, I think uh, the leg kick kind of, I checked that. And I think, I don't think he liked that very much. So given that it was your debut, were you almost bummed that it only lasted 16 seconds? I know that's a silly question, but sometimes you're so amped up for that debut and then you're in and out of there just like that. Yeah, no, I, I I feel like, you know, Ethan Shirk was on uh, the show not too long ago, and uh, that's that's my dude. That's my ride or die guy right there. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I didn't have a perfect fight. I didn't have a 15-second finish. And I was like, you know, is that a perfect fight? But uh, I wanted a longer fight. I wanted people to, to know, you know, I'm tough. You know, I, I got skills. I got – I'm well-rounded. So, yeah, I wanted a little longer fight, but I definitely wanted to get out of there in the first round. Were there a bunch of nerves too ahead of the the debut in May? Um, it, you know, a little bit uh, for the weight cut, but once you know I made weight and I we faced off and I looked at him and he kind of you know avoided that eye contact. I, I was all the nerves kind of went away and I I felt at home. From watching the fight, it looked like it was a good left hand that dropped your opponent. Were you confident going in that you had that type of power in your fist, given that it was your debut and you hadn't necessarily done that before? Yeah, um, you know, I feel like I kind of caught him off balance with that one. He was kind of on one leg. So I feel like it kind of took away a little confidence from my power, especially with the second fight. You know, I, I landed some good shots and couldn't really, you know, hurt the guys. And so it kind of took something away, but... Now I just know that, you know, maybe I need to, what I need to work on, maybe it's, uh, I need to hit him more. Maybe it's just not that one punch that knocks him out. Maybe it's two, three, the third one. So definitely gave me like, definitely made me feel like I'm not, you know, that guy, you know, so. So it's listed as a tap out to strikes on tapology, which you don't see too often, but that's clearly what it was when watching it. You could see your opponent waving, trying to convince you not to throw, throw more strikes on the ground. What's going through your mind in that moment? Um, a quote that my dad used to say, he said, don't stop until someone stops you. So it was kind of like, I was just waiting for the ref. And as soon as he touched me, I kind of, I, I was waiting for it. I knew it was going to happen, but I knew I had to keep it on them, you know, till there, just for future, you know, my instincts, you know, just to engrave that into me. So, were you kind of surprised that he was laying there and waving you off and not wanting to continue? I know a finish might have been inevitable either way, but you don't really see that too often. Yeah, uh, especially that quick too. Um, I don't know. I, you know, he he took a drive, he cut weight, he did all that, and you know, he had people come and watch him. Um, you know, it must have been, he must have been seriously, it must have been a real reason why he did that, you know, because he did put in a lot of work for it too. So, you know, I'll respect him. He's a good dude, you know, but I just, maybe he was nervous. You know, it was his MMA debut. He kickboxed with the pads and big gloves. So who knows? Maybe it was the leg kick. I don't know, but. So with the win and the nature of the win, you know, getting it done in 16 seconds, what were the emotions like after the performance and the debut? 
Um, I was excited uh, for a little bit, but the night wasn't over. Uh, we had, I believe, like six guys fight on that card. So I went right back, and then we was getting Ethan ready. So I didn't really celebrate until after, you know, he did his job, and then we kind of we kind of started celebrating a little bit. We was real happy just that uh, Ryan finally got to make walks with us too because we've been waiting for that. Me and Ryan's been waiting for that walk for years now, and it was a good it was a good night for us. Yeah, I've connected with Ryan a lot in the past, and I don't think I've asked any of the fighters that he's actually had hands-on experience with this question, but what has he meant to you and your journey so far in MMA? Honestly, man, Ryan's Ryan, you know, he's more than my coach. He's my family at this point. And like I tell him all the time, like, if he goes, I go. Wherever he goes, I'm going. Like me and him are locked in, you know. So he he means a lot to me. Uh I don't know if everyone has that connection with their coach or him, but me and him are kind of like, we are, I was the first guy he kind of took under his wing and, you know, he believed in me and it, it, it mean a lot to both of us. So. And let's talk about the second fight now, because you turned things around just over a month after the debut at Ohio combat league 30. Were you happy to get back in there so soon after your first fight? I was, I, uh, I didn't take, any damage so i was ready to get back in there asap uh i wanted to show people you know like i said the skills that i've developed all these years and um i just want i wanted to feel like a kid again i just wanted to get back in there and do it so i think one of the biggest moments in the fight that eventually led to the finish was the soccer kick to the body is that something you've thrown before or did it just come to you in the moment of the fight uh so that was uh all josh williams josh williams comes over to the corner and he just says uh he saw that i got him in that position a couple times and it was kind of just a stalemate i kind of let him up or he kind of wrestled his way up and uh he was like throw a soccer kick there knee him in the ribs do something like creative and uh i was able to you know stay calm and you know when i saw it i just i remembered him saying it and i was able to it slowed down for for me for a little bit and i was like all right here it goes and so it was a new thing. It was a new thing kind of in the moment. But since then, anytime I get someone in that position, that's what I'm throwing. Yeah, it was a sharp kick, an accurate kick, and it, you could hear the pop that it created in the arena as well. Did you know that, you know, it hit him flush in the moment and that he was actually dealing with the effects of that before you actually got the standing guillotine? I did. I knew I knew he was hurt. He got he kept showing reactions every time that I was landing. And, you know, everyone knows that's, you know, that's when you got a guy good. So I was just taking my time. I saw uh, points in the first round where I could have finished, but I kind of just wanted to take my time, you know, see if I had fight cardio, you know, see if I was going to feel the same in the second round. And that's kind of why I threw the thumbs up uh, in between rounds. It was my cardio felt good. I didn't feel tired at all. I was sweating a little bit, you know, felt good. Yeah, so the finish itself came 57 seconds into the second round via standing guillotine. By the looks of it, your opponent was feeling the damage you had inflicted and he tapped pretty quick. Do you think it was more of the choke or the overall damage that caused the tap? So uh, the choke was a 10 finger guillotine. So I didn't, so I didn't have my forearm uh, around his throat. I had my uh, fingers on his throat. And uh, that's a one I get people with, you know, that, you know, aren't really jujitsu in jujitsu like that. And uh, it's a it's a tough one. That one uh, takes your breath instantly. And um, I feel like it was the choke once he once that was locked in and he was against the cage. He had no like way to move, nowhere, to, no room to make. And uh, it, it didn't take long. I could hear him kind of. I just I could feel it. It didn't take much muscle out of me either. So it was low energy for me. And. It was taking a lot out of him. So, who taught you that technique, and is it easy for you now to pull off? Um, the ten finger guillotine. Uh, this is gonna sound crazy, but I learned it from YouTube, and it's easy to pull off if the other person doesn't know it's happening. So, like once someone sees it, you know it'll probably never happen again. But if it's their first time seeing it, you probably pull it off. So given that unique technique that's in your arsenal, was it something that you were hoping to finish a fight with and whatever amateur fight you had, it just so happened to be your second one, but was it a, a technique that you wanted to use to get a finish? So uh, Donnie Hughes, he's an up, up and coming uh, prospect as well. You'll have him on the show soon, I'm sure, after he fights a couple times. Um, 
me and him were jogging around the mat and a week before the fight and uh i was like i think i'm gonna uh, ten finger guillotine him i don't think he's seen it before i think I, I think i can do it and he was like i could see it he was like you get him against the cage you know you hit him a couple of times and he's gonna put his head down and you grab it up and it was picture perfect that's exactly how it happened so i think i think that's real like you i've heard guys on the show say many times like they've uh pictured a fight and it went exactly that way and uh i feel like if you do picture it hard enough and you believe that hard enough like it will it'll manifest itself and it'll happen so we talked about it we wanted that like we talked about it exactly yeah, that's insane that the image you had in your head actually came to fruition in your second fight. I know you've only had two fights, and the first one only lasted 16 seconds, but did you also envision what your debut would look like, and that's how it kind of panned out too? No, I didn't really have a game plan for that one either. I, it was just go in there and fight. Like I just, I, I've, I've seen so many different guys come in and out the gym. I, I trained with so many good guys. It was, It was like... I just this was this was just to see you know just to see what I got and uh, I went out there and I felt really calm and I, I almost I don't know I felt like I felt like I did in the gym I felt like I did on sparring day so if, if I felt comfortable and I feel like that that made it go by quicker you know I wasn't rushing things like I could have went out there and been really you know hype but I don't know I don't know I just I didn't see it going that way, no. I've I seen us standing and banging a little bit. It seems like you almost have a plan for everything when it comes to the fight day, fight week, everything. Like, we talked about the walkout earlier, and the second you walk out with the music, embracing all that, and then at least in your second fight, you envisioned how you were going to get the job done, and it came to fruition. Is that accurate in how you fight? Are you a planner? Are you someone that likes to envision how things will go and can actually put that into how it will go. Yeah, yeah, I, I plan. I plan a lot of stuff. Like this, this is going to be my career. You know, this is going to be my life. This is going to be what I'm known for. So I want it to be set up very well. I don't want it. I don't want it to be sloppy, even in the beginning. And um, I feel like holding yourself like a professional when you're not. Uh, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. So I feel like I'm just preparing myself for when it is. You know when it is when it does matter so with all that preparation too does that help with some of the the stress or nerves or doubts that might creep into a fighter's mind when you know how things will play out the plan the preparation i'm sure all that helps with that kind of stuff yeah it does yeah it does and also just putting myself in people who have it you know people who are worried about way worse things or you know nervous about way worse things like you know, there's people doing a lot worse things than just getting in a fight, cage and fighting. So I try to put, you know, empathize with other people before a fight too, and that really kind of calms my nerves. So, which performance do you like more, the one at o OCL 29 or OCL 30? Um, I like the opponent at OCL 29, and I liked my performance at OCL 30. So, kind of a little bit of both. You know, if they were kind of mixed, it would have been perfect. Do you think a lot about the opponents that you fight and, you know, what they've accomplished and how, you know, talented the fighters are that you're fighting against? Um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I take everyone very seriously. I know, um, you know, I know coming into the gym, I, you know, I could have took a fight, you know, really young and I would have been okay. I feel like, you know, I feel like I would have won. And uh, I feel like keeping me you know, in the back, you know, just working, working, you know, telling me, you know, my cardio might not be good enough or this might not be good enough. And then I get it good enough. Um, now I feel like I'm above the level that I'm fighting at. So I feel like the next one, you know, they'll, they'll step it up. You know, I talked, you know, about the 24th. I haven't heard anything yet. So we'll see what, what happens next for me. Are you hoping for a step up in competition next time? If it is on the 24th or not, are you just hoping for somebody that maybe gets you more excited to fight in a way? Yeah. And, and someone, someone that's uh, credible, you know, someone that, uh, someone that's fought before someone that's done some stuff and someone that I can uh, put on my resume that, you know, makes people take me seriously. When you analyze your first two fights, I know fighters are their own worst critics. They're perfectionists. When you look at your first two fights, how would you grade those two performances combined and what you've shown so far in the cage? 
Um, I have I have some skill to sharpen up. Uh, I have a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of holes in my game that I see, and you know my training partners see it too, and they expose it every day. So um, I I don't like. I don't like some technique things, but I do like how I conduct myself, how calm I am. Um, I, I do like that. I do like I do like my presence in there. So, once again, this is Alexander Hazelwood on Forged in Ohio. This is true for both of your fights so far. You've competed alongside a lot of teammates at Ronin. How much does that help you during fight week and on fight night itself? Um, it it it, it does help. Uh, I haven't had the chance to go without it yet um but you know i've been the hometown kid every time you know having five six guys fight on the card we're all getting ready at the same time cutting weight together so that that is a real good environment having those guys to go through that with and uh you know i am kind of excited to see what it's like not to have those you know fight out of state or something you know see see what it's like not to have everyone fighting and just the night be about me kind of thing. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because you mentioned in your debut how you won and then you had to turn right around because Ethan Shirk was competing that night as well. Are you looking forward to a time where you compete, you win, you, and you can almost take your foot off the gas, to, so to speak, and just enjoy the night, enjoy the win? Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it all. I'm looking forward to traveling, staying here, having having big home crowds and ha getting booed. I, I, you know, I know it's going to happen, so I'm looking forward to all of it. I mentioned your age earlier. You're only 20 years old. Are you happy with what you've been able to achieve and how developed you are as a 20-year-old mixed martial artist? No. Uh, I, I feel like I have to catch up. Uh, I started training with uh, some guys, like, you know, were coming in around the same time as me, like uh, Mac, Max uh, Metzger. And, uh, you know, he's, you know, you know, has so many different options right now. I feel like I need to catch up to those guys. And, uh, you know, they're my big brothers in a way, but, you know, I still kind of, I still, I still started a long time ago and I feel like I should be on where they're at. And I feel like I do got to prove myself and get there. So Max is also like what, 26, 27. So you have some time. <laughs> I have some time, yeah. Does it excite you knowing that, you know, as good as you are now, that there's still a lot of growth to be done with how young you are? It does. It does. Um, yeah, we got a little a little group of young guys right now, me, Ethan, and Donnie, that are kind of coming up. And it's kind of like generations, like uh, Melvin uh, calls it. Like, we got generations like Travis, them guys, Melvin, and then we got Max, Mark, Kobe, Woodall, just one. Uh, I believe last weekend and um, yeah so and then when you got me Donnie um, those guys coming up so it's like those generational talents and we just keep passing it and bringing new things like we're bringing things to them and they're bringing th things to us so you recently posted on social media that you miss Ohio Combat League. OCL's next event is OCL 31 on August 24th. I know you've reached out. Is, are you trying to get on that card and fight on the 24th? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I don't know how much longer I can wait, though, before, you know, the weight cutting becomes an issue. So, you know, you know, I'll give it a, a little bit more time. And, it, you know, if they hit me up, I'll be on that. What does a perfect activity schedule look like for you with training, fighting, recovery, weight cutting, all of it, really, everything that comes with being a fighter? Um, I feel the best when I stay busy. You know, I work, you know, nine to five. And then after that, if I, you know, can make the practice and not be late, I'm there. And um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I train late at night, uh, seven to nine. And, uh, you know, just coming to work, eating, staying busy, that's when I'm like the happiest. When I have free time and I'm sitting around and I'm not doing anything, kind of get in my own head a little bit. So I just like staying busy. That's my perfect day, just staying busy. You've had under five minutes of cage time with your two finishes. Are you content with getting these fights done early or are you looking to rack up some valuable cage time moving forward? Um, I feel like there'll be time for cage time there'll be time for wars and good fights um i don't want that time to be now uh i want to show people i'm higher than the level i'm fighting at right now so 
Do you feel like you still have to make that statement? I feel like you've already arrived on the Ohio amateur MMA scene with two wins in such quick fashion. Do you still feel like you need to make that statement, though, and make your name even more well-known than it already is? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like every fighter should. And, um, you know, just keeping that chip on your shoulder, that pressure to perform, like, that's my biggest thing. I have this pressure to look good, like this pressure to not make a mistake or... And uh, I feel like that's what, you know, makes makes me makes me perform how I do. So, you know, I haven't had much cage time. It'll come, like I said, but, you know, I'm looking forward to it. When it comes to things that motivate a fighter, all the factors that go into that, I'm sure you get motivated by a lot of different things. But is that the number one on your list, making sure that people know who you are and you're making these statements and you're climbing the ranks in Ohio amateur MMA? Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't say it out loud uh, very much. I say it to myself all the time. But uh, you know, I want to be the best in the world. I, uh, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be something. I wanna be the the greatest. So, you know, I know everyone in the sport wants to be that, but I truly feel special. Like, I wake up and, you know, sometimes it takes a toll on me and it makes me, you know, feel like I don't need some certain things or I don't, I skip out on certain things. But once I get that under control and I get stay motivated 24 seven without a name or without an opponent. I feel like I have a lot of potential. So, so that kind of leads me into this next one. I like asking first time guests on forge in Ohio about their goals in this sport. Answers can be similar, but everyone has their own path in combat sports. So what are some things that you're trying to achieve in MMA? Uh, I just don't want my name to die. You know, I'm only here for so long and I want to, I want to be in some, I want to hold some type of belt, some sort of Hall of Fame, something that is going to be here when I'm gone. So that, that's really what it is, just legacy, you know. You don't want your name to die. I love it. I don't think I've heard that one here on Forge in Ohio before. Before we wrap up, man, just anything you want to shout out here at the back end of the show? Uh, I think I shouted out all my boys, Asher, um, Asher Frederick, Ethan Shirk, Donnie Hughes, Ryan Benedetto. Um, that's my little team right there. I love those guys. You know, Josh Williams, everyone in my corner, all the Ronin guys. And uh, you, man, I appreciate all the love you give to Ronin and uh, what you do for the sport, you know. Of course, man. It's my pleasure. And thank you, Alexander, for coming on the show. You've really made your mark on the amateur scene in Ohio through two fights. And I can't wait to see how you build on those two performances moving forward. To get you out of here, I want to do the OHIO chant with you. It's a Forge in Ohio staple. So, O-H. I-O. Thanks, Alexander. Thanks again for the time. I'm looking forward to seeing you back in there, hopefully on August 24th, and we'll talk again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. That was Alexander Hazelwood, the 2-0 amateur mixed martial artist out of Ronin Training Center, who has been very impressive, to say the least, through two fights so far. He's 20 years old, he's 2-0, and he has a total fight time of under five minutes. We'll see if the incredible performances continue for Alexander, which... I have a feeling that they will given what he's already done and the work I know he's getting at Ronin Training Center as well. That's going to do it for episode 89 of Forged in Ohio though. If you enjoyed it, then don't forget to download the episode and leave the show a good rating if you're listening or if you happen to be watching on the Forged in Ohio YouTube channel, then leave the video a like and subscribe if you are new. For even more content or if you want to reach out to me directly, then check out the show on Instagram and Facebook at Forged in Ohio. Thank you all for watching or tuning in. I've been your host, Jake Murrin, and this was Forged in Ohio.